Well, hi everybody and welcome along to Edinburgh BioQuarter's Health Innovation District Bidders Session for the Procurement of a Private Sector Partner. A big thank you for your interest in this opportunity. With me today are uh, senior representatives from the contracting authorities who you'll hear from later in the session. Uh, before we start, just to give you a, a few housekeeping notes, which um, which you should see on your screen just now. Thank you, Tash. Um, today's event is being recorded and it will be made available online. Uh, the recording will be stored by the contracting authorities and transcribed and published afterwards through PCS. Uh, for all attendees, uh, as I've said already, can ask you to keep your cameras and your microphones off during the session. Um, you can submit questions via the chat function in Zoom. Um, if you have detailed procurement clarification questions, then please submit these through the PCS portal. Uh, we'll try our best to get through as many questions today if we can, but as this is a live procurement process, we may not be able to answer all of them today, and we may need time to clarify those through PCS. Uh, finally, any information you provide us during the session today is optional, and in doing so, you give consent for us to process this information. Next slide, please, Tash. Just to introduce myself first, I'm David Ridd. I lead on the marketing, business development and, and innovation as part of the, the, the team, the programme team working collectively on behalf of the contracting authorities to deliver the vision for uh, the Health Innovation District. Uh, more importantly with me today and whom you'll hear from soon is Paul Lawrence, Director of Place for the City of Edinburgh Council and Chair of EBQ3 Limited. Professor Moira White, the head of the University of Edinburgh's College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine. Derek Shaw, Commercial Director for Scottish Enterprise and a Director for EBQ3 Limited. And joining Paul, Moira and Derek is Anna Stamp, the Director of the Programme Team for the BioQuarter, and Mark Jones, Commercial Advisor from Cushman and Wakefield. During today's session, we'll hear from each of our guests. And as mentioned, we'll take some questions via the chat function. Just the next slide, please, Tash. So it is an exciting time for BioQuarter as we look towards the future and the development of the Health Innovation District. Our first speaker today leads the BioQuarter programme team. Uh, here to tell you about the vision and the opportunity at BioQuarter is the director, Anna Stamp. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and a very warm welcome um, on behalf of the contracting authorities and to everyone joining us this morning. Um, as you can imagine, the team and I are extremely excited to have finally gone live last week on PCS. Um, as David said, um, my name is Anna Stamp and I hold the very privileged position of leading the development of the next chapter for BioQuarter on behalf of EBQ3 Limited and its members. I've got two slots today. Firstly, I'm going to showcase the BioQuarter vision um, and then I'll return after our guest speakers um, to spotlight some procurement details contained within our contract notice. Uh, next slide please. If I can just start with a brief summary um, of what BioQuarter is. Uh, we are a triple helix site located three miles from Edinburgh's city centre. Uh, development um, of the site was triggered back in 1997 uh, by the very bold decision of our city forefathers to relocate the main teaching hospital from the city centre to an undeveloped area of Edinburgh called Little France. So over the preceding decades, we have had investment of over £600 million has taken place to create what we are today. We have an on-site community of 8,000 staff and students, plus a huge number of daily patients and visitors. Uh, we have two major acute teaching hospitals, uh, plus the Edinburgh Medical School and a large number of academic research units. Biocorter is simply a melting pot of activity with over two and a half million square foot of academic, clinical research and tenant accommodation all under one roof. Next slide. However, BioQuarter has reached a tipping point. Um, NHS Lothian and University of Edinburgh's investment will continue to take place to grow the clinical and academic research development. But to be a truly translational center of excellence, we need to also invest in our commercial innovation ecosystem at the same pace and scale. This takes investment and it takes expertise. Uh, next slide, please. Over the past uh, 24 months, uh, the contracting authorities have developed both a transformation vision um, and delivery strategy for that uh, vision. 
Um, they are seeking to procure a private sector partner uh, who will work in partnership with them, which will unlock Biocorter's full potential and uh, deliver our vision. Next slide, please. Our vision is transformational. Um, we want to transition Biocorter You've you've jumped onto um, silent. I'm afraid. Anna, your your mic's come come on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Could you go back a slide, please? Just a few. There we go. So uh, again, um, our intention is to transition the site with a very ambitious ambitious vision. Uh, we want to transition Biowater into Edinburgh's health innovation district a global destination for pioneering health, innovation and enterprise. Uh, next slide, please. Delivery of the vision uh, will allow us to tackle uh, not just health um, and global uh, UK and local health issues, um, but it also be part of the regeneration of the local communities uh, with jobs and skills. We're looking to deliver economic growth and employment attract, create, grow new companies, and nurture and develop talent. Uh, next slide, please. With investment and expertise from the private sector partner into new health innovation accommodation and the ecosystem and placemaking, we can transform the site into a mixed use neighborhood of Edinburgh, an urban quarter for people to live, learn and work, an urban quarter with shops, cafes, hotels, nurseries, residential homes sitting alongside our new state-of-the-art innovation labs and offices. A bold vision and a bold delivery plan. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Um, great presentation, uh, good background there. Um, quick question uh, coming in. Uh, there are a number of fantastic innovation locations in the UK. Um, why why Bioquarter? What, what sets it apart? Uh, what makes it different from others? It's a question we get asked a lot, David, and it's, it's quite simple. I mean, first of all, we have everything under one roof already. But most importantly, we have a significant amount of land which is undeveloped um, and, and ready to go. And really that sets us aside from other um, parks of the same nature um, where they are struggling to expand or they are perhaps uh, locked in. But in addition to the, to, to the land and in addition to having the ability to have everything under one roof, we have also um, the, the two acute hospitals. We have the University of Edinburgh, but we also are very uh, um, excited because the Usher Institute is being built at Biocorter and we really see that as a game changer. Um, the Usher Institute is a, a data hub um, for the, 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 the new data-led um, research, which Moira um, will touch on in her presentation. And that really is going to set Biocorter aside. There's no research now that's not going to be advanced using data and to have the data head HQ sitting right at the heart of Biocorter is, is, is going to be amazing and really transformational for the site. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to introduce our second speaker uh, from the University of Edinburgh, as Anna, um, lovely segue into it. Uh, a world leading university, of course, with its roots firmly established at Biocorter. And off the back of a record breaking year for industrial and translational awards, with four spin-outs in the therapeutics arena in the past 18 months, receiving VC funding from the likes of Syncona, SV Health and Advent. I'm delighted to welcome the head of the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine, Professor Moira White. Thank you very much, David, and good morning, everyone. Touching on the last question, my role this morning, I think, is to tell you that the University of Edinburgh has the reputation for excellence and also the future vision to anchor a world-leading biomedical campus at Edinburgh Biocorter 
integrating research, education, clinical care, commercialisation and importantly, as you heard from Anna, combining this with making it a, a pleasant place to live for students, staff and, and others. Uh, first slide, please. So Edinburgh Medical School was founded in 1726. It's the oldest in the English speaking world and has had huge global impact in medical education. For example, uh, our alumni founded five of the Ivy League medical schools in the US. Our rankings have increased even since Anna's slides and we're now ranked 16th in the world as a university, typically top 20 for biology and medicine and we undertake globally significant research. We're also renowned for medical education. This year, we're ranked first by the Guardian League table and second by the Sunday Times uh, for our undergraduate medical programme. And this means that I think we're one of the few sites in the UK that really does have the stature and pulling power to um, drive a development of this type. Next slide, please. And actually, I'll skip over that, as Anna has already described the campus, and tell you a little bit about our, our vision for the BioQuarter. So our grand challenge is to transform your health span. That's not your lifespan, it's rather the number of years that you can hope to live a healthy life. And to do that, we have to tackle the big diseases that really impact on health, the health span of our population. And obvious examples include dementia, heart disease, and cancer. But to do this, we're moving way beyond the traditional uh, clinical research and laboratory research to bring in um, our colleagues in science and engineering, uh, physicists, chemists, um, informaticians, um, experts in artificial intelligence, but also social scientists from across the university to undertake research without boundaries. And to do this, as Anna said, we really have to invest in our campus, uh, in our people, obviously, but also in our infrastructure. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly about the three institutes that we've established at the BioQuarter and what we see them doing over the next few years. Next slide, please. So Anna's mentioned the Usher Institute, which is a flagship institute for health data science, building on Europe's leading school of informatics in uh, Edinburgh, but also on Scotland's remarkable electronic health data systems, which means that we can track um, people's health events over time, going back over 30 years. The Usher Institute's been funded by the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Deal, which is anchored around uh, data-driven in innovation. But our stature means that we've attracted two major investments from UK Research and Innovation and also from the British Heart Foundation. And we link through to extraordinary computer infrastructure in Edinburgh, including the UK supercomputer Archer 2. So the Usher Institute, which will open in approximately two years' time, uh, will host 1,200 people that will bring together uh, industry, academia and the NHS to work together on novel health solutions for the prevention and treatment of disease. Next slide, please. So just one example of an Usher initiative that's already underway is the establishment of the Advanced Care Research Centre, in which we want to directly address the challenges of old age and infirmity. And the centre has been created through a very generous award from Legal and General and has already, in less than 12 months, attracted a further 7 million of government investment in medical research. And what we plan to do is to use this extraordinary data infrastructure to understand and predict when people will need um, care and support in later life, develop new technologies of care, and also new models of care that go way beyond care homes and aim to main people live it, maintain people living independently in their own homes by the use of novel technology and data. Next slide, please. We're also uh, extending 
Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the other thing we need to do, of course, which you will realise is a major challenge of our time, is develop a workforce that is able to uh, take care of our ageing population. And we need to transform our health and care workforce to deliver the right care in the right place at the right time. And to do this, we need a holistic vision of education from care home workers all the way through to hospital consultants, perhaps developing new types of practitioners to support our care needs. And this uh, this will be a major initiative at our campus, acting as an anchor for the whole of South East Scotland to train the health and social care workforce. Next slide, please. We're also investing um, substantial funding in transforming our existing Queen's Medical Research Institute to bring together our uh, expertise in heart disease, and dementia and other neurodegenerative disease. We're making major investments in brain and body imaging, and the QMRI is also the home of the highly innovative Health Technology Accelerator facility, where physicists, chemists, and engineers are working together to develop new optical imaging approaches to diagnose disease non-invasively in totally new ways. Next slide, please. And my final uh, new institute is the Institute of Regeneration and Repair, which is opening in less than 12 months' time after approximately £91 million of investment. And this is aimed to develop cell therapies for treatment of degenerative diseases. Uh, so when our organs fail and become scarred, whether it's lungs, livers or joints, can we develop a uh, our own cells to be reintroduced into our bodies to maintain tissue function. That, that this is really cutting edge research of high potential is demonstrated by the fact that the UK cell and gene therapy catapult um, are taking a floor in this building um, and that we already have a number of very successful spin out companies in this area at, that will be anchored in the new institute. And my final slide, really just to say, can I persuade you that we can deliver? And I thought the best example of this was, is our contribution to the city region deal, which was signed only three years ago. And since then, we have, deliver, uh, we have exceeded our deliverables targets in teaching, research, adoption and enterprise by more than doubling our targets. And we've developed substantial infrastructure that will be in the new Usher Institute to access Scotland's unique electronic health data systems. And in the last 18 months, we've been able to pivot those resources to make really major contributions in COVID-19 research. Um, using Scotland's health data, the fact we host the UK supercomputer, to um, run a number of studies that you may have seen in the press that really have impacted on the COVID-19 pandemic. We've done the major research identifying risk factors for who gets severe COVID. Uh, the EVE2 study, which has been in the press a lot recently, is the best data on whether the vaccines work and the extent of their side effects. And through the genomic study, we have really changed our understanding of disease and developed new therapies, identified new therapies to, to, that are now being tested in the clinic. So that I think is an example, both of our excellence and our agility in delivering what is truly transformational biomedical research. Thank you. Thanks very much, Moira. Um, question for you on the, the, the ecosystem and the development of a health innovation ecosystem. Um, how, how important is it to work in partnership uh, and to create a, an environment where you can actually promote, um, promote health innovation from, from within? So our, we can only succeed through partnership and obviously uh, crucial partners uh, outside the university, first and foremost, are our Cognate Health Board, NHS Lothian, 
which with whom we have a very long-standing and close relationship. And we share many activities, including a joint research office and R&D uh, set up a clinical trials unit, clinical research facility, in order that we're truly integrating research with patient care. And with them, of course, we collaborate to train the doctors of the future and other health professionals. So that's a key partnership. But through our partnerships with uh, the city and with Scottish Enterprise, we can also reach out um, into the collaboration and enterprise opportunities. So absolutely, everything that we do is built on partnership. And just finally, it has been quite a year in terms of impact. You've, you've highlighted some, some incredible developments in your presentation there. And I, I spoke about the, the spin-outs, the successful spin-outs and the, um, the industrial collaborations and academic collaborations you've, you've, you've managed to achieve these past 18 months to two years. Yes, so um, just to give people an idea of the level of innovation in our uh, university. In the last 12 months alone, our students, let alone our staff, have established a hundred spin-out companies. We've had three major spin-out companies from the university this year. We've attracted in the cell and gene therapy catapult because they see the enormous potential of our work. And before the Usher Institute has even opened, you can see that we're already generating interest and in and. Uh, uh, interest in, in that opportunity, which as Anna highlighted earlier, I think is one of the aspects that will make our, our campus truly world leading. Moira, thank you as always, and I'm sure we'll come back to you at some point uh, in the, the session. Now, placemaking and partnership are crucial to ensuring an economy thrives. Edinburgh BioQuarter is one of the most significant long-term programmes that Scottish Enterprise has undertaken. A key landholder, they own and manage nine and the BioCubes and have supported the growth of companies such as Roslyn CT, Aquila, which was acquired by Concept Life Sciences, and Iomet Pharma, to name but a few, and Iomet acquired by Merck. From Scotland's National Economic Development Agency and one of the contracting authorities, of course, here's Commercial Director Derek Shaw. Thanks very much, uh, David, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming along to the event. I'm delighted to attend this session this morning. All of the partners are really excited about Bioquarter and no more so than Scottish Enterprise. Excited as we move into the next phase in, in Bioquarter's evolution, a journey that will build upon the success today and develop Bioquarter into a thriving health innovation district in Edinburgh where academics, clinicians and entrepreneurs come together in a vibrant community. Next slide, please. In the eight or so minutes I've got this morning, I wanted to outline why Biocorter is important to Scottish enterprise, but more importantly than that, important to the growth of the Scottish economy. Next slide, please. But before that, it may be helpful for you to hear from me, Scottish Enterprise's perspective on the story so far. This has been a 20 year journey so far and a unique partnership between the City of Edinburgh Council, NHS Lothian, Scottish Enterprise and the University of Edinburgh. Together, our skills, our expertise, our reputation and the investment we have made into Biocorter have formed a formidable partnership. There have been significant developments during this period that results in the bi-quarter that we have here today, but our shared vision and ambition is aligned in terms of the opportunities for tomorrow. Next slide, please. And then the vision and ambitions we've got for Bioquarter are mirrored in Scottish Enterprise's own strategic objectives. And this slide outlines what those are. The first is about ensuring we are building growth in businesses, sectors and regions across Scotland. And our focus on place and building vibrant economic communities across uh, the, the country that will really spread increased wealth and well-being. Bioquarter is absolutely aligned with this ambition. Scotland's economic needs and opportunities vary from region to region, so we work with regional partners in the way that we have with the Council of the University and NHS on Bioquarter in Edinburgh to support regions and their businesses adapt to, 
and take advantage of economic opportunities. We do need to look to the future, not necessarily the economy of the past or even the economy today, but the economy of tomorrow and specifically those areas where Scotland has a real competitive advantage relative to other countries. And we need to prioritise resource and investment behind them. And finally, building Scotland's reputation and reach in strategically important markets is our fourth ambition. And here it's important that we increase inward investment and capital investment into Scotland in the way that we're looking to do with the next phase of, of BioQuarter. Next slide, please. This slide is very busy, so apologies, but it does attempt to outline Scottish enterprise on a page in terms of what we're, we're here to do. The important thing to note is our focus as an organisation on a small number of economic opportunity areas where Scotland has real strength. There are four, and one of those is in health and wellbeing. And from those four economic areas, we've prioritised our focus into seven defined national programmes, and two of which are directly in the space that BioQuarter operates in, namely our Health for Wealth programme, as well as Future Healthcare Manufacturing. Next slide, please. And I thought it would be worth providing an overview of these two programmes, again, as it demonstrates how BioQuarter is at the heart of our own strategic objectives and ambitions as an organisation. The Health for Wealth programme is engaging with key partners to deliver opportunities by building a highly effective innovation ecosystem, linking the NHS, industry and academia, and using this to enable economic outcomes driven by digital health and data. It will result in better healthcare outcomes for patients by using innovative new technologies and services developed here in Scotland and delivered in a more cost efficient manner. Again, this mirrors exactly the vision for, for BioQuarter. Our future healthcare manufacturing programme is focused on supporting and expanding Scotland's manufacturing and supply chains, responding to drivers such as new categories of medicine, where Scotland has real strong supply chain capabilities and world leading academic expertise. Next slide, please. So why do we think health and wellbeing, healthcare and the life sciences sector are areas of real competitive advantage for Scotland? Well, the stats speak for themselves. We have one of the largest life sciences clusters in Europe with a combination of large multinational companies operating here together with startup and early stage SMEs. Indeed, there are over 750 companies operating uh, in total, employing over 40,000 people, often in highly skilled, well-paid jobs, contributing 7 billion to the Scottish economy and over 1.2 billion in exports. We have a highly innovative academic and entrepreneurial base with a strong track record of starting, growing and scaling companies. Indeed, we're the, the second largest region for, for spin-outs. Our life sciences companies have been really successful in raising private investment and investing in capital and innovation. And indeed, as a, 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 our own organisation is one of the largest investors by volume in the UK and has supported and invested into a number of health and life sciences companies over the years, and we continue to do so. But that in itself is not enough. We need growth and growth is what we are seeing. There's been a threefold increase in revenue of life sciences companies since 2015. We're anticipating revenue to reach up to 12 billion by 2025. And we're investing in the wider ecosystem to support that continued and increasing growth, not only in by quarter, but through the 56 million investment into the Medicines Manufacturing and Innovation Centre, which has been built outside Glasgow. Next slide, please. But this is all in relation to the sector in Scotland. What has been achieved at Bywater is also very impressive, and Anna touched upon it uh, at the beginning of our presentation. We've invested over 620 million to date uh, between the partners. Bywater currently supports over 8,000 people who work, study, and innovate there. It has added significantly to the economy over the years, over 200 million per annum and over 2.7 billion since its inception. And in many ways, this is just the end of the beginning as we move into the next stage in the journey. Next slide, please. As I discussed, the sector is strong and growing in Scotland and it's played a key role in the global response to the, the pandemic, which has resulted in increasing demand for facilities and driven significant investment and growth. We need to capitalise on this growth through existing and new opportunities. 
the demand from current commercial tenants at Biowater and external companies seeking to relocate there is growing, and it's the potential to deliver substantial economic and social benefits at national, regional and, and local levels. The economic opportunities for, for Biowater are extensive and impressive. So in phase one, it's the potential to create uh, an additional 3,000 jobs, and in phase two, jobs could increase to, to 21,000. So by any standard, a significant increase. And moreover, our desire to increase commercial space, we have the potential to increase the number of commercial jobs by 9,000, which would be a 20-fold increase on the current total. And all of this will not only benefit Edinburgh, but the whole of the Scottish economy, an additional 750 million over phase one, rising to 4.62 billion on completion of phase two. Next slide, please. I said at the start, Scottish Enterprise and all of the partners are excited about the future. We are. So let me summarise where we are. Bioquarter is one of Scottish Enterprise's largest and strategically important long-term programmes. It's a unique partnership with all partners share the same vision and ambitions. It plays at the heart of Scottish Enterprise's own strategic ambitions around place, economic opportunities, building growth in business sectors and regions, and extending Scotland's reach uh, internationally. Scottish Enterprise recognises the importance and significant growth potential of health innovation to the Scottish economy. The sector is growing and the future potential is, is significant. As our chief exec said, over the last two decades, the Biowater has played a pivotal role in cultivating world-leading medical research and, and life sciences innovation that is improving lives around the world. Now is the time for, uh, to take the, the next step, to become a vibrant community, creating jobs, homes uh, for thousands of people. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ray Derek. I'll, I'll let you get a, a drink of water there. You mean, yeah, there you are. <laughs> um, listen, that was a really interesting presentation and interesting to note the, the demand, um, which I think is very, um, very important. There is strong demand and across this Scotland, really, for commercial health innovation accommodation. Certainly, anecdotally, through the, the UK Science Park Association, which Bioport is proud members of, uh, you hear that demand is there. But you talked about the economic opportunities in health and life sciences. Um, why, why is BioQuarter so critical to making the most of those opportunities and, and really achieving the growth that the contracting authorities are looking for? I, I think you touched upon it there, David, in terms of the demand uh, for, for facilities and um, the demand that outweighs uh, supply. Um, but it's not just about um, uh, demand. It's also about the unique proposition that Biowater has in terms of everything being under one roof. That Anna um, mentioned it at the beginning, where clinicians, when entrepreneurs combine and, and innovate, so a virtuous ecosystem, uh, which I think is 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 unique. Um, so I think the the demand plus the nature of Biowater places it in a, an excellent position to capitalise on those growth opportunities that we're we're seeing. Thanks very much, Derek. Um, just a reminder that you can um, put some questions into the chat um, function if you have any um, today. Um, we'll hear from Anna Stamp again in just a little bit on a little bit more information on the procurement um, uh, process. But uh, for now, the, the expansion of BioQuarter is clearly a, a key part of Edinburgh's economic future, uh, an area earmarked for health innovation development, supporting wider growth and regeneration in the southeast of the city, and of course with lasting benefits for local people, uh, jobs, education and opportunities to nearby areas like Green Dykes and Craig Miller. So I'm really uh, happy uh, to say that we have uh, the Director of Place for the City of Edinburgh Council and also the Chair of EBQ3 Limited, uh, Paul Lawrence. Paul. Uh, thanks, David, very much. Uh, and good morning, everybody. I'll try and be swift. I'm, I'm mindful of time. But I, I really want to go back to um, the first question, David, that actually came up as a result of Anna's pre uh, uh, presentation, which was why, why the BioQuarter, why Edinburgh? Uh, and I'm going to try and go through uh, very briefly uh, what I consider to be the key elements for success and to tick them off. So firstly, do we have world leading intellectual capital? I don't think there is any doubt of that. Anybody who's followed many of Moira's colleagues through the pandemic knows that Edinburgh is one of the global centers for uh, health education and innovation. And even in Moira's short presentation this morning, 
you've seen, seen the sheer range and quality of intellectual capital we have on site is the heart of this project. Second key factor for success, strong partnership. Um, as David says, I chair the EBQ3. I've also now for a couple of years chaired the wider uh, bio uh, quarter partnership, which has involved other partners, critical partners. Moira mentioned them, for example, our colleagues in NHS Lothian, who I should say are also investing separately in the bio quarter campus. And uh, whilst partnership working is always complicated, because particularly because of governance across organisations, um, uh, being hard to get in place together, hence the creation of EBQ3, so we do it once. The quality of partnership working here has been better than I've seen anywhere else in the UK where I've worked. You have core partners absolutely aligned, have wider partners in place and able to bring people on board. So we have really excellent leadership and quality of partnership working Yes, we do, and now legally in place together, bound together. Thirdly, we have land and property. Yes, we do. You saw from Anna's presentation, we have existing property, we have new investment, Usher, the I Pavilion on the way, we have expansion land under the control of the partnership, we have effectively land and property assets together. Fourthly, planning infrastructure. Um, uh, and anyone uh, uh, here today knows that planning can be um, a challenging process, an expensive process, and one that needs to be got right. Um, we as a council have just published the new local development plan for Edinburgh. It's in its six weeks representation period, um, imaginatively titled Our City Plan. Um, it clearly sets out and allocates BioQuarter as a mixed, youth, mixed use health innovation district. So as an allocation, it's absolutely in place. The policies around BioQuarter are set out very clearly. And so we're fortunate that our planning process, and this procurement process are coming together at the right time. And on the infrastructure time, and, and I think I may be slightly amazingly the first person today to mention COP26. Um, in an era, in my view, in development terms, that will be dominated questions of sustainability, whether in location, layout, design, building typology, accessibility. Um, we, we are working from an accessibility point of view um, to secure um, a light rail line to serve by a quarter in the future. Um, uh, many of you will know there is already a, a tra extension to the Edinburgh tram network taking place. And we are close to uh, submitting to colleagues in the Scottish government plans for a north-south tram line, which will show uh, the BioQuarter in the south of the city, uh, joining up with the city centre and going north to actually our other major development area in the city in Granton, um, at the waterfront on the 4th. Um, that's going to take a while to happen. In the meantime, um, we have existing excellent public transport services and our infrastructure, uh, particularly for active travel, has improved significantly over the course of the last two to three years. So our infrastructure is good with the prospects of being absolutely outstanding. Our planning is aligned. Um, from a financial point of view, um, we as a city have delivered a range of innovative public-private partnerships, I suppose most uh, notably recently with our partners, the Scottish Government, Scottish Futures Trust and Nuveen at the recently opened Edinburgh St James, where we put in place Something called a growth accelerator model, which was a way of levering added value public realm um, and labor market activities, uh, which in turn secured um, public investment. We have a range of other similar um, arrangements in place. So we know what public private financial innovation looks like and are open to trying to work together to put that um, in place. And last but not least, and this sounds like a slightly commercial thing to say, I don't apologise for that, Edinburgh has a brilliant property market. Edinburgh has a strong um, market for residential properties with a significant um, problem affordability, which means uh, that demand wildly outstrips supply. Edinburgh, as you've heard from my colleagues, has a strong desire for more commercial space in the right locations. 
and adjacency in that point is extremely important. And here you have all the right kind of place factors where those commercial opportunities can be delivered. And more broadly, the southeast of Scotland is probably um, in the UK's top three or four destinations for inward investment, partly um, uh, because of the uh, intellectual assets to, to um, finish where I started um, that we have in place. So we have a buoyant property market um, and that really makes it a compelling proposition for investors. So those ingredients are all here. The partnership now wants to expand to work with others to really make vision reality. Thanks, David. Thanks, Paul. A couple of questions uh, coming in for you. One is on the tram line. Um, you mentioned that there. Where are the council, where are you in the process for the north-south tram line extension? We, we've just completing a study with the snappy title of the Edinburgh Sustainables Transport Study 2, um, which uh, is effectively the uh, business case for a north-south tram line. Um, we're just coming close to finishing the outline business case for that. Uh, and we're doing that to align with the Scottish government's um, new investment programme um, in transport. Uh, colleagues on the call will have seen investment in city regions south of the border. Transport Scotland, which is in effect the secretariat for um, uh, the Scottish Government uh, as Transport Department, will publish um, their new programme for investment, hopefully before Christmas. And our um, outline business case is a key contributor to that. So we'll see how that fits. We're confident it will. And when it does, we'll then move forward to the detailed business case. Paul, thanks as always. Great to hear from you. Uh, we'll come back to you with any further questions. Thanks very much. I'm just going to hand over now, uh, back over, as I mentioned earlier, to Anna Stamp, who has a bit more detail around the procurement process uh, and uh, the timeline. Anna. Thanks, David. Um, so um, over the last uh, 24 months, um, the contracting authorities have been working incredibly hard preparing uh, for the, the start of the procurement. And as I said, we're very excited that we went live last uh, Monday, Tuesday. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just spotlight um, some of the um, uh, areas of the procurement that I thought would be interesting for the bid teams, uh, which I know are joining us um, today. Um, the work that's gone um, into this, um, we are, um, has been significant, but really the purpose of it was to make sure that the partners were all aligned and that we had an understanding, a vision, um, and a, a framework for which to go to procurement on um, with the intention of um, really marching through the procurement and, um, and, and, and not and, um, having a, a, as, as, as much as we can with public procurement, um, a fairly uh, easy uh, roadmap. So first of all, um, what we are procuring, um, we are looking um, to procure um, a long term and, and um, long term is one of the, the, the key messages, um, private sector partner um, that will deliver um, all the new buildings, associated infrastructure and public realm on the available land. So the, the diagram in front of you um, is the anticipated boundary um, of that land um, if you can see underneath the, um, the yellow, um, all undeveloped land. Um, um, but it's not about just about buildings. And this is a really critical message. It's also about investing and establishing um, our, our health innovation model and services. So the expectation is that the private sector partner, one of the pillars, um, will be able to, um, able to implement um, a health innovation model at uh, BioQuarter and deliver its associated services. But also equally important, as, uh, as uh, many of us have mentioned, is what BioQuarter can do for the local communities. Um, the local communities are undertaking their own regeneration, and we believe that BioQuarter can be a really important element of that. So our third pillar is about working in partnership because everybody will need to play their part in this and really look at what the community impact that BioQuarter can have uh, with regards to skills, jobs and health. Uh, next slide, please. So 
So we've heard what the opportunity is um, from many of our speakers, but as bid teams, what is the opportunity for yourself? Um, so really just to kind of whet your appetite, we have um, in the region of 64 acres of uh, land available um, under the ownership of uh, Scottish Enterprise. And as I say already, uh, it, it remains undeveloped. Um, we have done early development assessment and we anticipate that that land can accommodate in the region of 360,000 square metres um, development capacity. So that's on the land that's available. Obviously, in addition to that, we've heard about other partner university and NHS projects. Um, so that is the development capacity of the, the land available to the private sector partner. Um, we've positioned by a quarter in uh, the new um, city plan. Um, obviously, ch um, the, changing it from um, what it originally was, which was a science park, into our new vision, which is a mixed use innovation district. Um, and with that, we've positioned within the city plan up to um, in the region of 2,500 um, uh, long term uh, residential units. In addition to that, obviously, we're looking for a cluster of amenities. We're looking for hotels, shops and cafes. Um, and back to the long term investment um, is that we are looking for a partner um, with a 25 year contract and the ability to expand that to 10 years plus another five years. So it's a long term joint venture partnership. Uh, next slide, please. So as many of us said, what, why, why pick by a quarter um, as bid teams um, and, uh, and, and, and why do we look to you um, to, to, to throw your hat in the ring? And uh, as we said, there's many science parks across the UK, um, but we believe that we have a unique set of credentials uh, that really will set us apart and make this a really um, exciting investors opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. So our contract notice went live last week. Um, within that, we've included um, three key documents um, for you, in addition to obviously the procurement uh, documents, which are standard to PCS. Um, we have developed a bidder's information guide, um, which you can uh, download from uh, the PCS portal. And within that document, we have um, included everything we believe that you need for buy quarter, its history, um, the partners, um, the, the, the EBQ3, um, the team, the vision, but also the, the demand uh, for space, we believe, um, is at by a quarter. So it's a comprehensive guide, um, um, which I encourage you to, to download and read. In addition to that, we've included a draft copy of our invitation to participate in dialogue, um, which will go out to the five successful bid teams um, that are successful through the first stage. And again, uh, within that document, um, we um, illustrate and, um, and develop our thinking for how we're going to deal with dialogue and the later stages of evaluation. And then finally, we include the draft heads of terms for the two main legal contracts um, that will underpin um, the contracts at the end of the procurement and that underpin the joint venture um, arrangement. Next slide, please. So the structure um, of our procurement, um, which you can get more detail in the bidder's guide, um, we've broken it into stages. So obviously we are currently at stage one, um, which is the SPD. Um, we're using case studies. Uh, we will select uh, five uh, bidders to go through to the next uh, round. All information on the case studies plus the pass and fail mandatory questions are all included within the SPT guidance document. Trying to get through that as quickly as we can um, and on to stage two, which is our outline solution. Um, this is with uh, five, the five successful bidders. Um, we will dialogue with them on outline solutions um, and then we will invite um, outline solutions to be submitted, of which we will then evaluate. Um, and, um, and three bid teams will go through um, to the detailed solution. Our intention is to try and get through SPD and stage uh, one and stage two as quickly as we can and really get down to three bid teams um, where we will start to develop detailed solutions which we will dialogue on and then into final solutions which we will evaluate 
um, until we get our final uh, preferred uh, bidder. There will then be a period, obviously, of contracts with the preferred bidder um, before um, the, the, the conclusion. So really, um, you know, uh, we've got five critical steps and the, the message is we're trying to get through the initial steps as quickly as we can within the, um, the bounds of public procurement and down to three bid teams. Next slide, please. You will see again in the bidder's guide um, our, um, our four themes, um, which we are really basing our scope on and our evaluation, but also our dialogue sessions as well. So we have the four themes, theme A being the property development and the management of that property, um, buildings and infrastructure public realm, so uh, fairly familiar. Um, theme B, very critical, is the health innovation. We're, again, as I said, we're looking for not just bricks and mortars, we're looking for teams to provide uh, an effective and sustainable health innovation long-term model and services that will activate, grow, um, our, our innovation um, ecosystem in lines with our vision. Uh, theme three is our community impact. As I said, working in partnership, we, um, we really need to construct a, a way of how do we make sure that Bywater really has an impact on its uh, local community with terms of uh, jobs, skills and health. So again, that's one that we're going to develop in partnership uh, with the partner. And then, of course, theme D, which is the commercial arrangements and the legal arrangements. And, um, and so that's our four key pillars. Um, and as I say, our valuation criteria, our dialogue and our scope are all aligned uh, to those uh, four themes. I hope you will become very familiar with them. Uh, next slide, please. And then our timeline. So obviously uh, going live last week, our first um, deadline is the 10th of December, very important deadline um, for bid teams um, on the event this morning. Um, thereafter, we will go through our evaluation of those bid teams um, and, uh, and, and into um, final decision about who goes through to the next stage. Um, there, thereafter, obviously, you can see from the timeline, we're marching through dialogue um, at the outline stage and details stage through to final solution stage, which is early 2023, and then on to contract award. So that is our, um, our anticipated timeline, um, emphasised that is based on a set of assumptions. Um, so we will look to adjust it as we understand what these assumptions are. Uh, next slide, please. That's us. So that's a march through David of our procurement um, and spotlighting some of the areas. Um, as David rightly says, if you have um, detailed procurement questions uh, relating to the, um, the actual opportunity, um, if you would submit them through PCS and we will, um, we will answer them uh, over the next uh, week. Um, and uh, look forward um, to, 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 to meeting with you at, at some stage in the process and, and getting on to dialogue. Thanks, Thanks. Anna. That's, that's really, really great. Uh, we have had a few questions in. Uh, as you say, we'll try, we've tried to get through as many as we can. Um, quick question from Struan about the I Pavilion, which Paul mentioned earlier. Is it, has it been confirmed that it's moving to BioQuarter? I can answer that one. Um, if you look at page 36 of the Bidder's Guide, there's information about the I Pavilion there. NHS Lothian has undertaken an options appraisal and a feasibility study uh, and an outline business case has been approved by Scottish Government and that was October this year. The project now moving towards detailed design stage with plans to submit a full business case in early 2024. We were marching towards the hour and we all want to, to, to manage our time here. So a quick question as well for you, Anna, on the back of what you've just said, um, you have mentioned the timeline being flexible depending on what happens. Um, You've released information just now. What's the intention to release more information throughout the process? Yeah, we've included the information that we feel is relevant for bid teams for the current stage, the SPD. But obviously, as we go through the, the, the various stages, as I outlined, we will be releasing more detailed information um, as we go through the process. Um, and that will go to the successful bid teams that get through stage one. Um, so the answer to that is yes, we will continue to release information, but also update and refine information that has been issued um, to as part of the submission, including the timeline 
um, which as I said is based on a set of assumptions just now, things like how many um, bids, bids do we get in the SPD, um, that type of thing, and also how quickly we can get through governance as well, which is obviously a critical part um, of the, 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 the process. Thank you very much. Uh, quick question for Mark Jones. Mark, uh, how much involvement are the contracting authorities expecting to have throughout the development process and how much of the framework is fixed? If you can, uh, I know we've not, we've not heard from you yet, but we, we are marching towards the uh, hour. That's, that's fine. Um, sorry, can you repeat that, that question again? David? Sorry about that. Uh, how much involvement are the contracting authorities expecting to have in the development process and how much of the development framework is fixed? Um, so starting with the contract authorities, how much involvement they're expecting to have, um, it, it's relative to each of the areas. Anna's already mentioned the, the health innovation ecosystem uh, and the involvement there will be quite substantial. The, 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 particularly the NHS, uh, uh, although they're not a contracting authority, but are on site uh, and the university um, will be a, a substantial uh, a partner within the, the organization of the ecosystem and how that can accelerate and attract new companies to uh, to buy a quarter. In terms of, of the development, um, probably less so. I mean, the, the real crux here is, is to push onto uh, the private sector partner, the delivery program. It's a really long-winded joint venture in terms of, of, of period of time to, to work through nigh on 360,000 square meters of space. It's not, it's not going to be short term and therefore it's got to react to market cycles. It's got to react to changes in, in market demand. Um, so the contracting authorities have set out a process where they can um, set the vision through the control documents that are published or will be published as part of the dialogue process. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, matters like the place strategy. Um, there is an ambition that the site will achieve up to 50% health innovation space. Um, but beyond that, everything really then rests with uh, the bidders uh, through their dialogue process in setting what we've termed as being the, the overarching development plan, which is essentially uh, a master plan and development framework um, that sets a medium to, to long-term vision. There's a process within the um, uh, joint venture agreement that allows that to be reviewed at periodic stages um, and that that is set as a partnership context. It's it's a partnership document that, that controls the, the long term vision of the site. Land is drawn down through a mechanism that's referred to as um, phase development plans. And once that land is transferred, with the exception of a future uh, a profit share arrangement, uh, the whole of the, the development process, the risk and reward sits with the private sector partner. Excellent. To start the second bit, in terms of how much of it is fixed, relatively little. Um, I mean, Paul touched on this, Anna's touched on this as well, that the city plan sets out the context of uh, um, the planning ambitions for the site. The control documents set out the long-term vision, um, but we are, we're not experts on every single aspect of what needs to be developed, when it needs to be developed, uh, uh, and how do we react to a market that is, is evolving as well. So, there are within the, the bidder's guide you'll see um, a, a master plan framework a very roughed out master plan framework that sets the context for how much development footprint is available on the site um, but that's that's our initial expectations uh, uh, and the whole of the development framework will be developed through dialogue with the shortlisted parties uh, and that very much will be led by private sector bidders um, so it's very much their uh, their opportunity to set forward their store for how they see the site being developed. There's there's relatively little that's being demanded by uh, the public sector partners in terms of, of form uh, or a, a framework. Thank you very much, Mark. The message is, is very, very clearly coming through. So we're, we're coming up on the hour now and we've tried to get through as many questions as we can today. We hope you found the, the session useful. Uh, for those questions we haven't managed to get to, Please submit these through the PCS portal. We will respond to you in a timely fashion. Next slide, Natasha, just before we finish up. Um, for bid teams wishing to visit BioQuarter, um, you can do so. Um, you can obviously enter the public areas of the site. Though do be mindful of other site users if visiting the public areas, especially the hospital, uh, and be mindful of the staff, patients, businesses. If you're wishing to access the PSP land zones, which are outlined in the bidder's information guide, then please submit a request to the BioQuarter program team 
by emailing info at edinburghbioquarter.com and making that request and we'll do our best to accommodate you on that. So that brings us to the end of our session today. I hope you found it interesting, as I say, thanks to all our guests. I found the presentations to be uh, really insightful and interesting. You can certainly get the sense that this is an exciting point in time for the development of the BioQuarter. So it just falls to me to say another big thank you uh, for attending, for your interest uh, in this extremely exciting opportunity. Goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>